Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Luke Strathman, and I'm a policy associate here at the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL. I'd like to welcome you all to the sixth edition of JPAL's research webinar series, which features new evaluations by JPAL affiliated professors. Today's webinar features Tavneet Suri, a professor at MIT's Sloan School of Management and the scientific director of JPAL's Africa Regional Office. Her research centers on agriculture, household financial access, and informal risk sharing. Today, she will discuss recent research that looks at offering smallholder dairy farmers in central Kenya a loan to purchase a durable 5,000 liter rainwater harvesting tank. This is ongoing work with Yost Salat, William Jack, and Michael Kramer. If you'd like the full paper or slides from the presentation, please visit the event page on our website or send us an email at webinar at povertyactionlab.org. Tabneet will present for about 30 minutes, and then we'll be happy to take questions from our audience for another half hour or so. If you'd like to submit a question, either during the seminar or the Q&A session at the end, you can click on the green bar at the top of your screen, then click chat and enter your question. Thank you again for joining us today, and now I'm going to hand it over to Tabneet. Thanks, Luke, and thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all today. I guess uh, virtually, if not any other way. <laughs> um, to people I know, hi everyone. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about rainwater harvesting tanks like Luke mentioned, um, looking at asset collateralized loans and whether this is a way to encourage adoption of rainwater harvesting tanks. Um, okay, so hopefully you can all see the slides. Mm. I'm gonna just make them full screen, give me one second. Okay, so what motivated the big picture part of the research project was trying to understand technology adoption, sort of motivated by this quote of Grilicus who says, real explanations of productivity growth will come from understanding the sources of scientific and technological advances and identifying the incentives and circumstances that brought them about and facilitated their implementation and diffusion. One thing we worry about a lot is if we think that most of productivity growth is gonna come from new technologies, then uh, how do we understand how these new technologies get adopted and what are the constraints to them? So in this paper, or in this project, we study a technology that is pretty expensive. Um, it's gonna be about 300 to $400. Um, so it's not in the realm of seed varieties or in the realm of fertilizer. This is just a very expensive thing relative to those things. And so we want to ask, what's the role of credit constraints? Do people seem to be credit constrained? And what are these credit constraints binding? The bigger question is, are they good investments? And this would be one of one such good investment potentially that are not invested in that have high returns. So there's been a big literature, both in largely in the RCT space, uh, showing that if we give cash grants to very small firms, they tend to see very big returns of these cash grants. So this is the work by um, Chris Woodruff and others and Marcel and others. Um, so if we believe that and we believe there's lots of these binding constraints, then how do we best alleviate these credit constraints? Um, is microfinance the answer? Is it other credit contracts? And how do you build credit contracts that, that will allow you to get to sort of alleviate some of these credit constraints, but at the same time not create wholesale default. So one response to this has been, let's do lots of joint liability contracts. Okay, I don't want to expand credit because one reason for not expanding credit is you don't know risk and you might just get everybody to default. So MFIs and uh, guarantor contracts have been a way to try and expand access to credit where you kind of get group liability or joint liability. Okay, so I'm gonna, sign a contract with Luke who's sitting right here, and if I don't pay, Luke's gonna cover me. And the idea is, you know, either Luke sort of tells everybody, oh, guys, you know what, Tabneet's great, and I guarantee she's a good person, so she's gonna repay, so that's one potential. He's able to select good risks, happy or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or the other one, please don't say you're happy to do this one, Luke, <laughs> is, you know, you enforce repayment through monitoring. So he shows up at my house every day and says, tell me you better repay that loan or else. Okay, so that one you're not allowed to do. <laughs> um, so it turns out that these sort of joint liabilities can do lots of things. They could either be a way for people to highlight good risks so you have better information, 
or they could be a way to sort of use local social monitoring to repay. So it turns out this is what the sort of ideas that lie behind MFIs, and they reach a lot of people, but it turns out it's still a very small fraction of the people in the world. Um, so, you know, is this because there's not enough investment opportunities, or is it that people don't actually like these joint liability contracts, right? I don't like Luke showing mm -hmm. up in my house every day to try and get me to, to pay this. So the bigger question on the finance side is, look, what proportion of people want to borrow who can't? Okay. Um, do these sorts of joint liability requirements or deposit requirements select better people? Um, and do these requirements incentivize repayment? Do I get safer borrowers? Do I get better repayments? By the way, by a deposit requirement, I mean some loans often require a deposit up front. They say, oh, give me a third of a deposit of the loan. And the idea is at least that amount is recoverable. Um, so in this paper, we're going to ask, what's the potential for asset collateralized loans? I'll talk a little bit about deposit requirements, but sort of on the side. Um, but we want to think about an asset collateralized loan. What do I mean by that? Think of a car loan in the U.S. or a mortgage in the U.S. Um, you know, I borrow money for an asset, and the asset is the collateral. And if I don't repay, they come repossess the asset. Okay, so this is the developing country version of the repo man. Um, so we're going to design a project that has an asset collateralized loan, okay, which is not seen much in developing countries at all. And then we'll follow the impact of this asset as well to show you it has good returns. Okay, so what are we going to find, just in case some people have to disappear early? We find that there is lots of screening in the credit market and too much. There's lots of great investments out there that are not, that are not funded in some sense. Um, when we use a credit contract with asset with the asset as collateral, these are very strongly preferred. Okay, so we compared a group liability loan to an asset collateralized loan, the take up is 20 times higher. Okay, so lots of people want these asset collateralized loans. The thing you worry about is, oh my God, I just gave the village drunk a loan and he's never going to pay it off, right? It turns out that there's not much accompanying increase in default, and you'll see that some people end up paying off a little early. Um, you know, this is an asset that everybody wants and that is in very high demand. So in some sense, I think that helps the case because you're using sort of an asset that is easy to repossess, hard to hide, and in high demand. So people actually want it. And I'll show you it affects productivity, time, use, and girls' education. 